We are now starting a brand new sermon series from the book of First Thessalonians. I would like to subtitle it with a thriving church. And to give you a little backstory of First Thessalonians from Acts 17, if you would like to know more about the backstory or the background of First Thessalonians, how this church established or started, read Acts 17. Again, to give you an insight, all those letters of Paul, they are precipitated from the book of Acts. Because the book of Acts, that's where Paul had his three mission trip. He traveled around Asia Minor, which is now the modern Turkey, and also Greece to Rome, to Italy to Rome. All right? So that's the missionary journey of Paul. Those things happen, and you could learn more about, of that in the book of Acts. If you would like to dig deeper, read the book of Acts. It would be awesome. It would be beneficial. Okay, so to give you a background of First Thessalonian Church. Thessalonian is a, a city in Greece, and it became a church, and that church called Thessalonians, right? So on his, in his second journey, on his missionary, second missionary trip, Paul, from Jerusalem to Antioch, he traveled going to Asia Minor, which is the modern Turkey. It's the second trip, second missionary trip, okay? Please bear with me. I'm giving you the background so that we could uh, lay the foundation of our study for the book of Thessalonians. All right? In every travel of Paul, in every city that he visited, he encountered persecution, stoning, mocking. He was accepted by some Jewish and Gentiles and Greeks, but there are also persecutors who stoned them, who tried to remove them from place and mock them, and even started a riot in order to stare the people around and destroy the work of Paul in preaching the gospel. And then one day, he passed the city of Thessalonica, which is now the modern Thessaloniki. That's in Greece. Imagine, he preached there three weekends, just three weekends, Three Sabbath, he preached in the synagogues, and outside there, he preached. And some Jews accepted, and some Greeks also accepted the preaching of the gospel. But there were people, Jewish, who were jealous about what Paul was doing in the city. And they started a riot, and then they persecuted Paul. And then people who accepted Paul, they they, they tried to help Paul to escape from Thessalonica from this persecution and danger brought by the persecution. And they went to Berea, another city in, oh, sorry. Oh, yeah, in Berea. And in Berea, also a city in Greece, they preached the gospel and then they were persecuted. The same people who persecuted there from the Thessalonica went there and persecuted them. And then again, they moved to, uh, to Athens, also city of Greece. What happened there, again, there was some pressure when Paul and Silas, Timothy, saw that there were so many idols there, they were distressed. And then they, they preached for some time, and then they moved to Corinth. And when they reached Corinth, they stayed there for 18 months. Remember, how many months, how many weeks did they, did they stay in, in Thessalonica? Only three weeks. Because of persecution, they went to Berea and then to Athens and now they're in Corinth. And then there were so many problems happening there because of the church in Corinth. And then he was also thinking about the church in Thessalonica. A very young church, three Three weeks of stay there and then maybe around a year now after he left, maybe the church in Thessalonica, a very young church, one year old church, he was thinking about that. What happened to my baby church in Thessalonica now that I'm here in Corinth? And he sent Timothy to visit Thessalonica 
in order for him to check what happened to this young church in Thessalonica. And after awards, after Timothy visited Thessalonica, he went back to Paul in Corinth and reported something. While Paul was distressed, discouraged because of all the pressures he, he experienced from Thessalonica, Thessalonica to Berea to Athens to Corinth, because in his, that's his mission. He's going to city after city. And now he's in Corinth. He was distressed, quite discouraged. And now he received a report from Timothy about the Thessalonian church. And he said, good news. They were thriving. That encouraged Paul. And the report of Timothy, somehow, he also brought some concern that Paul need to address a minor concern, but regardless, he was encouraged. And because he was encouraged, Paul, Timothy, and Silas, the team, they wrote a letter to the Thessalonian church. And this letter is the first Thessalonians. The first Thessalonians that we have right now in our Bible. What you're reading right now, what you have now in your Bible, that's the first letter of Paul to the Thessalonian church. Actually, it's the first letter of Paul to the church. The Bible is not in chronological order. Maybe the Romans was first after the Gospels, but actually Thessalonians was written first before Romans. First Thessalonians, the first letter of Paul to this church. There were Ephesian church, there is Colossian church, there are Philippian church, other churches, Rome, but first letter of Paul was first Thessalonians. And you have it right now. Wow. And we're going to learn today from the book of Thessalonians, the first letter of Paul that tells us that this was a thriving church. A three-week church that Paul established, and now just one year, they were thriving. How many years? Lavish Message Church right now? 16, 17? They were just one year. But Paul was so encouraged to see this church thriving. They were thriving. Despite of the pressure, persecution, paganism, idolatry, persecution from the Roman Empire, they were thriving. And Paul was so encouraged. And let's start reading the first chapter of First Thessalonians. But before that, I would like to ask you this question. Uh, is this working? Oh, do I need? Oh, there you go. What drives you? What drives you? Jet? You drive? What drives you? What drives you? Your mom? What drives you to come here? Oh, my dad, my mom. Oh, my sweetheart. Oh, my crush. What drives you there? Oh, food, coffee. Oh, fellowship. Drove me there. What drives you? What drives you to come here? A friend? Fun? What drives you to come here? We learned that today. First chapter of Thessalonians from chapter 1, verse 1 to 10. All right. Let's do this. So I'm, having, I'm having a hard time with my, there you go. The first two First two uh, verses, Paul, Silas, and Timothy. Who are these three stooges? Who are these? They were the writers of the book of Thessalonians. You thought that only Paul was the writer. No, it's there. Paul, Silas, and Timothy. They were the cause senders of this letter to Thessalonians. Okay? So, that's the way they write a letter during the time of the first century. They, they put the, the writer on the first line to introduce themselves. Paul, Silas, and Timothy, 
they're writers. And the recipient to the church of Thessalonians in God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Meaning this church of Thessalonians, they were in God the Father, in God the Lord Jesus Christ. And this, this makes God the Father and Jesus Christ in the same level, equal. So you cannot discount the, 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 the deity of Jesus Christ. He is indeed God because he's in equal level, in equal uh, label with God. God the Father and the Son. Grace and peace. That's the normal uh, salutation greetings in the ancient world. Grace is the normal greetings of the Greeks. Grace, charis, grace to you. Grace, that's the Greeks. That's the way they uh, greet one another. And peace, that's the way the Jewish people greet one another. So Grace and peace. Paul and Silas and Timothy, was try, they were trying to, to, to connect with Greeks and Jewish. Because churches during the time they are composed, they're constituted by Greeks and Romans and Jewish people. We always thank God for all of you and continually mention you in our prayers. Wow. That's how Paul loved the church in Thessalonica. Because of what they did. Because of what they experienced from God. I always thank God for all of you. It is my prayer that I will always have this kind of heart like Paul. To thank you, all of you, every day. To thank you and continually mention you in my prayer. And I hope all of you as well have that kind of heart to thank the person next to you. Your life group members, your life group leader, your leaders. To thank these people in your prayer. And remember them. That's the normal salutation of the letters during the time of the ancient or the first century. And let's continue. Here, you, you can see the next verse that we are going to read is the three things that really help us to be strong Christian. Do I have a problem with the, my battery? There you go. There's a delay. So your work driven by faith. I asked you a while ago, what drives you? And this church is a driven church. They were driven by God. They were driven by the Spirit. From verse 3 it says, we remember, we, Paul, Silas, and Timothy, we remember before our God and Father, your work produced by faith. What drives them? Their faith. Their faith. We are going to focus in this one verse for our three points. But there would be subverse and now in this particular verse 3 6 and later on the next point there will be another verses that would would help us to see how this faith this love this hope drove these people in Thessalonica to continue in their walk with God and the succeeding verses will 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 show us how true or the truthfulness, or the veracity of faith, love, and hope in this church. All right. Are you still there? Brace yourself. There you go. Let's see the veracity of the, of the work produced by faith. There. For we know, brothers and sisters, loved by God, that he has chosen you. 
Because our gospel comes to you not simply with words. Church, if you're saying that you are driven by your faith, if you're saying that you have faith, therefore, the word that you receive from the Lord is not simply with words. The Bible that we are reading right now, that I'm trying to teach you, that I'm trying to, to, to keep on teach, tell you, that this word, the Bible, is not just a mere story. It's not just a history. It's not a power. It's not just a, a, a poetic uh, letter. It's not just something that we, we read randomly from a newsstand that you, get, you grab from Google. It's not just an ordinary email. It's not just an ordinary post in, in, the, in your Facebook account. No, it's not. This gospel, this word that this Thessalonian church received when Paul, Silas, and Timothy preached, it didn't come to them just simply word. There is power on it. Don't take it lightly. When you read the Bible every day, when you open your physical Bible or your U version for the day or I don't know what app you use for your Bible, don't take it lightly. Maybe you're just reading one verse. There is power in it because it was written, inspired by the Holy Spirit. When the, when the author of the Bible, those 40 authors who wrote the, those books in the Bible, they were inspired by the Spirit. Therefore, that power that inspired the authors of the Bible is the same spirit that is at work in you when you, when you read the word of God. There is power in that word. When you read the Bible that tells you that God is love, there is power on it. It's not just, it's not just a, a, a letter or a story or a Poetry written by Shakespeare. It is written by inspired authors of the Bible. That's why when they heard it, when Paul was preaching, there is power with the Holy Spirit and deep conviction. Do you experience that when you read the Bible? When you read the Bible and there is this conviction, you feel it, that's a marker of being a chosen person, chosen people of God. For we know, brothers and sisters, loved by God, that he has chosen you. We know that God has chosen you because the gospel that you received, the gospel that came to you, not simply with words, but also with power, with the Holy Spirit and deep conviction. If, you, there's, if there's no conviction when you read the word of God, May you, you should ask yourself, question yourself. God, why this verse or this passage just come to me just like an ordinary letter? There's no conviction. There's no power. Lord, I want this word to, to be a rhema word that would resonate with me. Church, this is something that you should take seriously. The Word of God. The Word of God. When you hear the Word of God, and you hear the word obey, then you have to obey. When you hear the word of God that says, forgive, you have to forgive. Because the word of God shouldn't come to you just merely a word that comes from an ordinary author. When you hear the word love, 
the spirit should remind you to love god love people love one another but your flesh would contradict that and say no i don't want to love that person i don't want to forgive because he hurt me i was humiliated by this person he accused me of something wrong he mocked me i was disadvantaged by this person why should i forgive if that's the case the word of god you are not accepting the word of god by faith you are resisting it if by if just by reading the word and then as if it is just an ordinary word and it's just stop there then it's not faith Remember the verse of the Thessalonians that came it says you know how we live and among you for your sake again remember that when we when you read the we that speaks of Paul Silas and Timothy you know how we live among you for your sake Paul Silas and Timothy they sh they showed to them how to live Christianity they showed them how to live in faith they showed how to live according to the word according to the spirit you know how we live among you for your sake you became imitators of us wow what a bold statement from paul you became imitators of us how are you assuming that these people live to imitate you and that was the report from timothy when he visited them and that's why Paul, Silas and Timothy wrote that down in this letter you became imitators of us and of the Lord that's faith my friend they're living the kind of life that Paul, Silas and Timothy lived Paul, Silas and Timothy lived according to the word and they also imitated that it did stunt the mount in saying that they also imitated the word of god that paul silas and timothy tried to live that's faith when you live the word of god you are living in faith and now you are driven by your faith when you work on something that's why this church in thessalonica they tried they grow they grew and because they were driven by their faith by not by some history not by some tales or any random story but by the word of god which is alive then you must live then you must work driven by your faith according to your faith so when you serve god don't serve god out of curiosity don't serve god out of the need there's a need i will go there no that's not the way how to volunteer to a church just because there's a need you would volunteer if that's your if that's the case or out of curiosity or out of your personal gain or maybe for fame or to be belong I don't think that's that's the right way to serve or to work for God and for people. Because if that drives you, there would come to, there would come a point in your life that you won't see or what you will not experience what you have expected, you will not see what you have envisioned. I want to see myself in that pulpit. I would like to see my my life on that stage. I would like to see the people applauding me, giving me appreciation not all the time you will be appreciated in the ministry not all the time you will be will be applauded by people not all the time that people will get, will notice you no it's not but, but if those things are your driving 
point or driving uh, that would drive you, I don't think you would last in the ministry or the work that you are doing. Because Jesus Christ himself, he worked for people when he was here on earth. But he was mistreated. He was misunderstood. He was neglected. He was even de de rejected by people. And yet, he continued. Why? Because he was standing on the truth. His word, actually. His purpose in life. So what drives you? Your work should be driven by your faith. If you anchor your work in faith, even though no one notices you, or even people misunderstand you, you would stay faithful. Remember, our work won't save us. Faith will do. What drives you here? I would come to church because that's my faith is stay to me. My faith tells me that I should continue, that I should stand on the truth. Next, let's see how this church thrived in the midst of persecution, trouble, and sufferings. Why they thrived? Because they were driven by their love. Again, as we continue reading, verse 3, work first, your work produced by your faith. Secondly, your labor prompted by love. They were driven by love. Again, the veracity of this love can be found in verse 7 and 7 and 8. And so you became a model to all the believers in Macedonia. Macedon Macedonia is the northern part of Greece. And Achaia, the southern part of Greece. See? They became a model, an example to all believers north to south of Greece. A young church. Paul just preached there for three weeks. Maybe now they're around one year standing or practicing as a church. Now they, were, they became a model to southern, the northern and southern part of Greece. In Macedonia, in Achaia. Wow, that's interesting. And verse 8 tells us, The Lord message rang out from you, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, your faith that God has become known everywhere. Therefore, we do not need to say anything about it. Because people already knew about you. Because of your love. Why? Why would you assume, Pastor Jun, that love drove them in their labor? Because people around, because the labor of this Thessalonian church, because it was driven by love, it impacted people. Believers from Macedonia in Achaia made these believers in, Thessalonians, in Thessalonica as models. Meaning something good, something great. Happened in this church. That's why these people was impacted by their lives. Remember, it's not your intellect. It's not your gifts. It's not your beauty. It's not your fame. It's not your money that would impact, truly impact the lives of the people. It says in 1 Corinthians 13, 1, 2, it says, if I speak in tongues of men or angels but, but do not love, I'm only a resounding clung, clanging symbol. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, if I have a faith that can move mountains but do not have love, I am nothing. What this verse tells us is that though you have all the gifts, all the talents in the world, but if you don't have love, then you're just like a clanging symbol. You gain nothing. 
Yes, you might impress people, you cannot impress God. Your people might be impressed, but it won't last. They would see your true colors. You would see their true, they would all see your true motives. Then it won't last. But this, I will assure that they were driven by love. Because people around them didn't see their hard labor for the ministry. But what but they felt the love of God through their service. People don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. Hmm? How many be I might be the most eloquent teacher and preacher in this room. But if I'm, if I'm, if I'm going to do it for my own personal gain, for fame, it's very tiring on my part. Because I'm not gaining any popularity here. I'm not gaining any, any fame here. It would be tiring for us to do something, labor, Work and labor is synonymous, but there's a, there's a slight difference. Labor is more, more harder, more, more pressure. That's why it says, first, your work produced by your faith. Now, your labor, your labor, your hard work for the Lord must be driven by love. Because without love, you could easily be swayed or you would stop easily because you are not driven by your love. You are driven by your personal agenda. That's why this church, they were driven by love. And people felt it. They felt it. People around them didn't, didn't see, ju didn't just see their hard work. But they felt the love. We may work so hard for the Lord with our personal agenda. But if we're going to continue doing that, we would fail. We would not last. Our activities, programs... And intellect may impress people, but we are only a climbing symbol. We won't gain nothing in the spiritual realm without love. Love is contagious. If someone hates you in your workplace, keep loving them. Love them. Pray for them. Remember, love is not, it's not just an emotion. It is an actual word. When, you, when God commanded us to love, you have to do it. You have to obey it with action. Love is continuous. That's why they became the model to all the believers in Macedonia and Achaia. And the Lord's message rang out from other people. You don't have to say it. Just act it out. Actually, you don't have to post it on Facebook. You don't have to post it in social media that you love your wife or your husband. What your husband wants, your wife, your action. My kids know this. That's why they don't post on Facebook telling that they love me. I want their actions. I want to feel it. I didn't, this, I didn't see any posing in Facebook. God, I love you. Have a great day. Do it. Even though you don't say it, I feel it, Mako. I feel it, Iya. I, could I can feel it. You don't have to pose it. It just, it could easily rang out from you your love your labor for your husband your labor for your wife your labor for your kids your labor for your children your labor for your mom and dad even though you don't say it actions speak louder than words right how's your labor was it driven by love or driven by something else? This church, they were driven by love. That's why people made them as a model. They don't have to say it. Oh, we love our Lord. Oh, we are Christians. 
Yeah, they don't have to brag it. They just act it out. Put it into practice. Oh, I know. This church, they love God. They're Christians. Oh, this person? Oh, I know. That is loving God. Thirdly, what drives you? Your endurance driven by hope. Again, your work produced by faith, your labor prompted by love, and endurance inspired by hope. Imagine just three weeks of preaching of Paul during that time. But they were, they accepted the word with faith. With the powerful conviction of the spirit. That's why it turned to faith and they were prompted by love. And now they're enduring hardship with hope. So the Thessalonians received Paul and his team, Silas and Timothy, despite the threats and persecution around them. It says there. We remember, oh, they're reminiscing what happened during the time of their visit, the three-week visit in Thessalonica during the time of their second missionary journey. They were there. There were so many persecution, so many people trying to dis distort their teachings and trying to create a riot. To disturb their meetings. But yet these people who received the message. We remember before our God and Father. You, oh, sorry. Not there. There. Uh, there. For they themselves report what kind of reception you gave us. The reception that they gave when they visited these people. They remember that. I can imagine what kind of reception this Thessalonian people gave Paul, Silas, and Timothy. Despite the fact that they were being persecuted. That despite the fact that the word that they're teaching is a new thing, a new concept, new idea to them. Because it's the new faith. Jesus Christ that they're trying to preach. And yet they were accepted. Come on. Teach and preach to us. When they were received in, the ho in homes. In synagogues, we, we remember, they, for they themselves report what kind of reception you gave us. They tell how you turn to God from idols. But first, for you to receive such a new faith, a new teaching, that's hope. That's driven by hope. Because they knew exactly what would happen to them for them to accept a new faith, a new God that Paul, Silas, and Timothy were teaching and trying to sell them. Oh, this is the God that we know. For them to receive it, oh my God, this is radical. And not only receive them with gladness, Accept them in the synagogue and in their homes. They tell how you turn to God from idols. They didn't just receive the message, but they accepted it and put it into practice. And they turn to God from idols. They were idolaters. They were polities. There were so many gods that they worshipped during the time. This Greco-Roman culture, they are serving and worshipping Many gods. And yet, because of their hope, they turn to God from idols that they serve. I can imagine myself among the Greeks during that time. New faith, new gods. Preached by Paul, Silas, and Timothy. I would accept this. And now I'm going to turn from my idol. I idolize this idol for how many years? 30 years? 40 years? Since I was born, my mom, my dad, my uncle, my friends, my neighbors, my classmates, people in the community, we are worshiping the same many gods. And now that I found the new, the new true God that Paul was trying to preach, now I'm going to turn away from those idols, those gods, and serve this God. 
But Paul was preaching. The Greeks worshipped a whole pantheon of gods, meaning many gods. You know what? Much of their lives were in worshipping of idols. They would involve in sacrifices. Imagine that. These Greeks, they were sacrifices everywhere with their friends, with their neighbors, with their uncles, with their relatives. They were attending religious activities, festivals, attending local temples. That's the way of life in Greco-Roman culture. And when this Paul, Silas, and Timothy came, all of a sudden, they, this is their idol. They turn their backs from their idol, and then they turn to God. Do you know the ramification of that? When you turn your, when you turn your back, from your idols, when you turn your, 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 your faith to your newfound faith in Christ, expect condemnation. Even from your family, expect hatred. Expect marginalization. Expect that you're, it would affect your job. It would affect your business. Because the majority, they are pagans, Gentiles, non-Christians. They would no longer support your business. They don't want to work with you. They would not accept you in their meetings. They would put you in the, at the back of the queue when you are buying something. You are marginalized. By people, because you're no longer part of the society. But they endured it. Imagine yourself in that situation. Would you turn away from your idols? Would you turn away from your normal way of life as a Greco or in a Greco-Roman culture? It's hard, right? It's hard. You put your new allegiance into this one true God. And when calamity comes, you would be blamed. See? There was flood. There's calamity. Catastrophe. Why? Because you, Christians, you followed a new God. And now the many gods that we serve, they're not trying to judge us, condemn us with flood, with earthquakes, with famine, with all these things. I need to go back to my old lifestyle. I need to go back to my old ways. I need to go back to my idols because of this persecution. No, they did. They tried. So they were driven by hope. Hoping that God will rescue them. If you want something, you would endure it. Isn't it? If you would like a new iPhone, have you experienced that? You want to get, you want, you want, to get, you want to be the one, the first one who's going to get this iPhone released in New Zealand. If you're, if you're one of those, you would, you would queue in, uh, in, a, in, a, in a store. <laughs> you're waiting for the queue. You're waiting for the, you would stand there even early morning just because you wanted to get this new iPhone or you, any gadget or what have you. Or maybe this girl of your dream. You want this girl. I would wait. I would wait. Because I know I will have him or her. Because you know what? And to wait 
that's what, that's what we don't want. We don't want to wait. We are willing to pay for goods or something for our instant gratification. That's why instants in this world are so prevalent. Instant noodles, instant coffee, instant girlfriend, instant boyfriend. Instant husband, instant wife, instant error, instant here, instant there, because we no longer want to wait. But we want, really, the thing you have to wait. Good things come for those who wait. It takes six hours to build a Toyota. And it takes 30 days to build a Rolls Royce. Just some sort of analogy. They were driven by hope. That's why they endured the persecution, the ramification of their actions, of following their God, their true God. But this is okay. I know that God will help me. To wait for his son from heaven whom he raised from the dead. Jesus who rescues us from the coming wrath. And meaning to say, yes, there will be a coming wrath. But God will save us from that. That tells me, church, that this church, they are thriving. Because they were driven by their faith, love, and hope. Please know that if you are walking under the will of God, Learn to endure the wait with the hope. Don't wait without hope. Don't wait on the waiting room while you could wait in a waiting lounge. That's the difference, right? We don't want to wait. But if you would wait, wait with class. Don't degrade yourself waiting. You have a God who would empower you to wait because there's hope that awaits you. For those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not faint. That's why we hope because we have hope in God. And God will give you the best. That's our hope. Yeah, that's what drives you. And that's my prayer today, church. That your faith will drive you when you go to work. I am not giving in to this temptation. I am not giving in to this voice of the world or Satan. Because my faith tells me not to. My faith tells me to stand in the truth. My faith tells me to wait. My faith tells me to press on. My faith tells me. To rectify my wrongdoings, my wrong actions. My faith tells me to worship God, to serve God. My faith tells me to do this, to do this and do that. That's my faith. So it's so important, my friend, to read your word. Because your faith would only increase by increasing your knowledge about the word. You cannot increase your faith without the knowledge of the word because the word of God is the foundation is the anchor is the rock of our life where would you base your action where would you base your decisions where would you base your future the way you deal your life, the way you face your temptations, your trials. But with the word. That's why I'm so adamant to teach the word of God in this pulpit. I might sometimes sound boring because I'm too much in the word. I don't care. 
nothing will go back to God void. And thank you, Lord, that you would make this church founded in your word. And our love for you will drive us to serve you and serve people. And let your love continue to drive you to come to God in prayer, to come to church, to, to serve people, to come to your life group, to serve God, serve your community, love your children because of the love that, you, that God has poured out from you. To you, and now you are ex oh, let it overflow to people around you. And lastly, your endurance driven by hope. I would stand, I would continue to stand and endure all these things happening to me. I know I can't understand, I cannot understand. There's no, I don't have any idea why all these things are happening after I obeyed God. This is what I received. This is what I experienced. After I obeyed God, I experienced pain, trials, trouble in life. You are not alone, my friend. Even Jesus Christ, when he followed the, the mission of the Father, he experienced trials in life. He even bled. He even tortured, mocked, spat on everything. Paul experienced taunting, stoning. you don't understand after the disciples followed Christ to go to another side of the river of the sea and yet after that after they followed there was a storm a squall that 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 driven that almost capsized their boat and yet Lord we just followed you I just came to church I just prayed we just had our prayer and fasting. I just came to a conference. But Lord, what happened to my business? What happened to my relationship? I was removed from my post. I was waiting for this, Lord. But what happened? I don't know. Maybe you're, tr you're, you're going through a fiery furnace that, that, remove, that God is trying to remove all the dross all the things in your life that is unnecessary. God is filtering you, purifying you, polishing you. Therefore, you do it with hope. Because you know that your hope is God loves you and He will keep you from the wrath of God. That's our hope. That God one day will come we don't know when, maybe later on. Who wants to see God later on? Amen. Maybe tomorrow, maybe next week, we don't know. Are you ready? Endure. Because you are driven by your hope. Can we all stand, church? I firmly believe in my heart, as I always thank the Lord continually in my prayer about this church, Life Expresses Church. I believe that you are being driven by the Spirit. And it is my prayer always that God will continue to make this church thrive, continue to grow in the midst of recession, in the midst of hardship around us. We, we went through a, a pandemic. We went through difficult years. But praise God, we are still standing. We could still say, Lord, you are God, you are Lord. We still worship you. We will still serve you. Why? Because we believe our faith made us stand during those difficult years. And our love for God has driven us to continue because we have hope. If you're here today, you can't put your faith on the word because you're putting your faith on the world. You're putting your, you're putting your faith on yourself, on people around you. It's time to make a change. It's time to put your faith on the word of God, which is Jesus Christ. If you're here today, you're driven by your emotion. You're always driven by people around you, by fear, doubt, 
in the name of Jesus, make a change. Be driven by love, the love of God, your love for God and the love of God for you. If you're here today, you're losing hope. You cannot endure things. You could easily sway by this world. You could easily uh, deceive by the world, by the lies of the enemy. The arrows of Satan, Satan is about lies, fear, and doubt. Those are the arrows of the enemy. And he's trying to deceive you. You have to put your hope in God. You need Jesus in your life. If you haven't put Jesus Christ as the center of your heart, of your life, this is the time that you really need to put Jesus Christ as the center of your life. Just receive Him as your personal Lord and Savior. Ask God, Lord, I cannot, I cannot make a change in my life. I cannot change my life. I cannot make, I cannot transform my life. Lord, I surrender my life to you today. If that's you, simply receive Christ in your heart. Lord, I want you. I need you. Come into my life. Repeat this prayer after me. Lord Jesus, forgive me. Have mercy on me. I want to live by faith. Teach me. Help me. I surrender my life to you. Come into my life. Holy Spirit, come. Live with me. I want to live with you. Thank you for the forgiveness of my sins. Thank you for this new life that I have in you. I'm going to be driven by my faith, driven by my love, driven by my hope in you. Thank you for the new life. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. If you're going home today, driven. You are not get easily, you can't, you won't be easily swayed by the things of this world because you are driven. You know the direction. Your the power of the Holy Spirit is driving you. Amen. May God bless you, church. We'll see you again next Sunday. God bless you. Be a blessing to all people around you. Amen.